we have 187 Ruritan clubs who have not filed their 990N for a three-year period. Now, you know what happened to those 187 Ruritan clubs? Their tax-exempt status was automatically revoked. So that's a good segue for me to, to talk about that a little bit. But the same thing happens with us. If we don't file, we lose our tax-exempt status. Uh, that's a pretty harsh reality for a club or for an organization that's a 501c4 because we hang our hat on a lot of the benefit of being a routine club is the tax exempt status. And so we've got to work with these clubs, we've got to have the R35s so that everybody stays exempt. The value of tax exemption is roughly 28%. So if you, if you raise $1,000, the cost of taxes, if you weren't tax exempt, would be $280. So for every $1,000 you raise, you get to keep $280 extra dollars to put back to work in your community or in your district. In my mind, that's a pretty good chunk of change and you want to continue to have that. Specifically to the Club 990s, and I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly. I think I'm eating up Frank's time at this point. Um, we're not alone. I do, do want you to feel better about that if you can in, in terms of the fact that we're not alone. There are 6,500 Lions Clubs on the list. There are 900 Rotary Clubs on the list. There are 500 Optimist Clubs on the list. There are 700 JC Clubs on the list. Exchange Club has 100 clubs on the list. In terms of all total small nonprofits in this country, there are 279,000 small nonprofits on the list of groups that have lost their tax exempt status for not filing a 990N. That includes things like volunteer fire departments and rescue squads and uh, whatever other uh, nonprofits didn't file. So I can't imagine that there's not an outcry from this entire group. Uh, I will tell you that we've written some letters, but the fact of the matter is, it's, an, it's a requirement. It's a congressional requirement. It's a federal law that these groups have to file 990s. We started publicizing it back in 2007 when we first got the, the word. Uh, and I'll tell you how it came about. It was the Pension Act of 2000, uh, the P Pension Protection Act of 2006 that actually caused our clubs to have to file 990 ends. Now that wasn't really aimed at us. It was aimed at supporting organizations for, for 501c3s. Um, however, it applies to us. Uh, the way I try to explain it to people who call me, call me is that we weren't the target, but we actually got caught by the spray uh, of the bullets that, uh, that were a little more far reaching than the, I think that the Congress uh, intended it to be. At, at any rate, it's a requirement. It's a federal requirement. It's not a root to national policy, but a requirement by federal law. All of our clubs must file. None of our clubs are exempt from the filing except for two reasons. One is that they filed a 990, full-blown 990 form. The other is that they filed a, a 990EZ. Unless you filed one of those other two forms, every club in Ruritan has to file that 990N e-postcard. Now I'm gonna tell you some things about how that filing happens and we'll go through these real quickly because they're written and you don't have to memorize it or even write it down. Whoever files, for the, whoever files the 990N for the club has to have a valid email address. And just for your information, there are some free ones out there, Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail. You can get a free email address. Uh, you don't have to own a PC. You can go create an email address at a free PC in a library and file your 990 there. It's web-based, so you don't have to own any software in particular. Uh, the email address that they, that they ask you to have is the email address that they send back a, a email that says, we've either accepted your 990N or we've rejected it. If the club has trouble filing, they can go to the Urban Institute, which is the trusted partner of IRS for filing the 990Ns. 990Ns. Handouts are in the book, but I want to run real quickly through this with you to tell you where you go to do it. 
you log on to www.irs.gov. That's the IRS website. You choose the Charities and Nonprofits tab, two. You select the char Charitable Organizations heading, three. You select the exempt organization's filing requirements, four. You select resources and tools, five. You select annual filing, six. You, you under how, you click on a, a word here that's in quotation marks, seven. You, se you select that you are willing to leave the IRS site, eight. That selection will take you to the Urban Institute site, who is the partner for IRS, and then you have to register one so that you can log in, or if you've already registered, you log in. So if you look at all those things together, it's a 12-step program. Now, I don't know if that's important or if it's coincidental or not, uh, but there are 12 steps to getting to where you file your 990N. The interesting thing about that is there are only eight questions on the 990N. So it's actually harder to get to the place that you file your 990N than it is to file your 990N. And fun again, the funny part of that is two of those questions you may not even have to answer. The questions are, what is your employer identification number? And if you don't know that, we do. Call us and we'll give it to you. What's the tax year? Are you filing for 2011? Uh, what is the legal name of the organization and its mailing address? Any other names that the organization goes by? So unless your club has an alias, that's a question you probably don't have to answer. Name and address of an officer that you'd like to use as a contact. And if you're filling it out and you've got the three email address and you just want to pick on somebody else, you can choose their name. But it's probably going to be you. Uh, the website address. And again, this is one of those questions. If you don't have a website, then you don't have to put the information in there. You confirm that the club made less than $25,000 in gross revenue for the preceding year. And guess what? Oh, no, you have to tell them one other thing. You have, to act, you have to tell them if you are terminating, dissolving, disbanding, whatever the term uh, you want to use is. And that is it. Easier to do that than it is to navigate through the IRS site to get there. And so it boggles my mind because the clubs that are filing 990s, which is about a 15-page document and could require four or five different schedules, are filing them. The clubs that are filing the 990EZs are, are filling out a form that's four or five pages long, and they're doing it. But the ones that are losing their exempt status are losing it because they didn't answer these eight questions. So as district leaders go out there and, and encourage the clubs to do that. If your club fails to file for a three-year period, and that means they didn't file in 2007, 2008, or 2009, then, then the revocation of their tax-exempt status is automatic. You don't get a notice. You don't get a do-over. You're revoked. You have no status. All the fundraising that your club does at that point becomes taxable. The revocation cannot be re re appealed. You can't say, oh, but, and they'll appeal it for you. Not going to happen. The club's going to remain on the list even after you apply and get your tax-exempt status back. Because like us, we have a list. We have a list of clubs who have been forgiven dues. If we start to see repeat offenders, uh, you've got a club that asks for forgiveness of dues every third or fourth year, eventually we say no. With the IRS, they're going to run that list in perpetuity, I suppose. And so if your club's on the list, it stays on there. And if you don't file for three more years, they will revoke your status again. And if they look back and see that you were on the first list and now you're on the second one, you may not get your status back at all. The second part of what you have to do to get that status back is to file an application. How many of your clubs filed an application for tax-exempt status when it became a rear-hand club? I didn't expect to see any hands because actually nobody did. You're exempt under rear National's group exemption. But if you lose your status, 
you have to file this application. There are two applications. One's the 1024, and that's for a 501c4 status. And if your club happened to lose its application or its uh, status, and they're a C3, you have to file the 1023. The second form, and where they get you for the money, is 8718, and that is a that is a request for a determination letter. So if you apply for status and the, the IRS grants it, they'll send you a determination letter. And in, and in this application process, there are penalties and fines. You can have your tax-exempt status restored back to the time that it was revoked if you can establish reasonable cause. Reasonable cause in terms of the IRS uh, would mean that your filer, the person who was filing for your club, was gravely ill or some other situation like that. And in terms of looking at us and looking at clubs that have missed for a three-year period, you know, it would seem a little bit um, um, of a coincidence if, in fact, the filing person for your club was gravely ill three years in a row. Uh, I would suggest you get a new filer at that point. Uh, the fact of the matter is, establishing reasonable cause not to file this form is going to be extremely difficult to do with regard to the IRS. Now, the IRS is giving us some transitional relief. Thank you, IRS. It recognizes that many of the small organizations out there have never had to file income taxes before, and this is a first for them. They also realize that you're operated by volunteers, and, and I like this statement that they have right on their, their materials. They're operated by volunteers and face unique challenges in meeting federal obligations. And so I don't know if volunteers by and large have unique challenges in meeting federal obligations or not, but we'll take it because they're giving us traditional relief. Based on those two things, they will give you traditional relief. What they'll do is they'll treat you as if you have established reasonable cause not to file. And having done that, um, they have some eligibility. The club didn't have to file a 990, a 990EZ, or any other kind of 990 form prior to 2007 when this was enacted. If you meet that, you can move forward. You have to have been able, as a club, to file a 990N e-postcard in all three of the years that you didn't file, the 2007, 8, 9 years. And all that really means for that period of time is that you had less than $25,000 of gross revenue. The other thing you have to do is you have to file this application and the form by December 31st of this year. So let me say this. We spent three years and put, you can't even count them, probably 25 or 30 um, articles, posts, emails. It was in audit letters. It was in flyers that we sent out to clubs. We spent three years informing them about this legislation, and still we had 187 clubs that didn't file. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, we have six or seven months at this point to get those 187 clubs who didn't file their income status back. So this is pretty urgent, and you need to get familiar with it and go back out there and help these folks get their status back. Mike, yes? You made an earlier statement that as district leaders, it's our responsibility to, to work with the club and help get the status back, and then you say we've got six months to help. How do we know which clubs in our district have I'll get I'll get to that for you, Curtis. As a matter of fact, we're going to, we hope, in the next week, um, we're going to provide some tra transitional relief as well. The 1024 that you have to fill out is about a 15-page document. Of those 15 pages, you don't have to do a thing at all on six or seven of them. Uh, on four or five of them, there's a lot of generic information. We're going to fill that out for you. Uh, we're going to get those things as far along the process as we can, develop an instruction seat, sheet and send it to every club that's on the list. We'll copy you as a district governor uh, with a list of those clubs in your district. So you'll know who's getting this information. Well, in fact, we'll copy you and the assigned reps with the packet itself so that you get the instruction sheets and you know how this is done. Um, 
not a long time. A couple of other specific things, and we've already had one club reapply and get rejected, and the letter came back, and they said, you have to do this. And so I went to the literature and read, and sure enough, right there in the literature it says, on the top of the 1024 or the 1023, if that's the one you file, you have to write notice 2011-43. You have to write that on top of the form, and you have to write that on top of on the outside of the envelope that you mail it in. Now that's probably got something to do with routing, but if you don't do that, they'll send it back. You also have to attach a statement that basically says, and the, and the verbiage of the statement's in my presentation in the notebook, so I won't read it, I won't read it. But basically what it says is that we're eligible for this transitional relief that you're offering us. The normal fees that a club is gonna have to pay if they don't do this transitional relief if their gross receipts are less than $50,000 and in, 25, in 2010, that $25,000 threshold changed to $50,000. So if they don't do it by the end of this year, uh, they have to pay the normal fees. And if your gross revenue is less than $50,000, the fee to get your tax exempt status back is $400. If your gross revenues are greater than $50,000, then your fee to get your tax ex uh, exempt status back is $850. That's a lot of money, folks. And for 187 clubs out there, uh, it might be enough money to say, you know what, we're just not gonna do this anymore. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to do as much as we can uh, to try to get the status back for these folks before the end of the year. The, the scariest part for me is that this is not the end. Um, you know, we've got 187 clubs who haven't filed for the last three years. I don't know how many clubs are out there who haven't filed for a year or haven't filed for two years. And so there, will there be another 187 next year? Possibly. Will there be another 187 the year after that? Could very well be. Uh, I hope not because, again, we're going to try to keep this issue in front of people like you uh, that will help us get out there and beat the bushes and get these forms filed. They are super simple very easy don't let this kind of thing cost us 187 clubs we're going to do everything we can i will tell you that in the first three years of this program my staff actually took calls and went online and filled out 990 ns for about 200 clubs we'd be more than happy to take calls and fill out 990 ns for another 200 clubs if that'll save 200 clubs and so have them call us uh, they'll get a package of information uh, the other thing I want to say to you, and, and I want to say it uh, with a caveat up front. Our bylaws, Article 7, Politics, reads, Ritten National and its member clubs shall be non-sectarian and non-partisan and shall take no action endorsing or condemning any candidate or measure which is to be submitted to the vote of the people. Having said that, uh, I will tell you that I have written letters to every congressperson and every senator in the state of Virginia, and I'm encouraging everybody who will take up a pen uh, to write those same letters to the congressmen and, and senate uh, in your states, uh, because I think that we are, are an accidental victim of this policy. Uh, they weren't targeting us. Uh, but there are hundreds of thousands of small nonprofits out there who are feeling the, the heat of this legislation. And if they're not going to change the legislation, at least change the uh, penalty uh, so that it becomes bearable for a club. I believe our club should have filed. I'm not making any excuses. We've been telling them for three years, file your 990 in, file your 990 in. But having said that, $850 penalty will put a lot of our clubs out of business. And so we are writing our congressmen and senators. 